if Nikki was round there after hours, then you can forgive Crawshaw for assuming that she's his significant other. Making me his insignificant other. Oh, that's good. I'm going to use that. Yeah, I bet you will. <clears throat> Reminder, insignificant other. Do you know, it's a shame, really. Just when you and Nikki had started to bond. Feel free to read your paper. What, miss the inside track on how women think? No chance. Nikki will meet someone else soon and then she'll be out your way. The talk of the street. 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 Hello and welcome to episode 200 and two, three of the Talk of the Street, an unofficial Coronation Street catch-up podcast that agrees with our Twitter friend Den Lives and half expect to see the Billy signal shining over the cobbles the next time he tries to summon the Council of the Exes, except Sean, I'm Gavin. <laughs> and I've spent all morning explaining to millennials and Gen Zers that there are jokes in Steve Martin's 1977 King Tut song, actually. John, I knew you were going to say that. I'm not familiar with the King Tut song. Gave his life for tourism. That's funny. Gave his life for tourism. Yes, King Tut gave his life for oh, tourism. Oh, I see. Right. Right, because this was during that whole huge King Tut exhibition that was going on in the late 70s, where they were carting King Tut's corpse around America to show it off. Uh-huh. It was it was a decorated corpse, though. Well, I yeah, think it was, was more it a decoration that people were yeah, interested in. It was in. in the sarcophagus, but the fact of the matter remains, King Tut was inside that sarcophagus. They were carting around the country. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, you know, in, in the Bible, where they cut a piece off of a martyr and and tore it around the countryside to show everyone... That the martyr has died for whatever. Isn't that Braveheart? Thing. They do that in Braveheart too, but that okay. That was to warn people not to be like Braveheart. That was different than people supposedly being inspired by the martyr. Right. Is Steve Martin culturally appropriating ancient Egypt? No. In fact, he's... <laughs> I think the ancient Egypt fits so the No, but... in, in fact, he's satirizing the whitewashing of King Tut and Egyptians because there's also lines like he's my favorite honky and born in Arizona raised in Babylonia you know far too many lyrics of this song that I've never heard before I will it was it it was all over Twitter because it was like the anniversary because it was first on Saturday Night Live in April 22nd of 1977 so you know oh wow so this is like a 45 year old joke yes that now people are talking about well because that's a slow burner isn't it but, well people like lots of people are posting about it on twitter saying haha the song is goofy but there are no jokes in it you didn't have to make jokes in the 70s you just had to be high on cocaine oh. it's like well it's probably <laughs> something that there are jokes in it actually you just kind of had to be there now it was uh Barry Cryer, mm-hmm. famous Barry Cryer, the old uh, British comedian who died fairly recently in his nineties. Mm-hmm. But you know he was a he was a touch point in comedy throughout decades in the in the UK, and and the, the newer comics right took advice from him, and so he was very relevant. He wasn't mm-hmm. the, this old vaudeville guy who was barely relevant after the the 1960s or 70s, this guy was relevant right up until the day he died. He said, explaining comedy is like dissecting a frog. Mm. Nobody laughs and the frog dies. <laughs> and I think I think he's onto something there. Right. Yeah. How are you otherwise? <laughs> Do you super? Uh, you know, it's been a week. I had, I had a lovely day yesterday. I took our oldest... For his out for his birthday, which was a month ago, because mm-hmm. he doesn't answer texts. <laughs> Yesterday, he doesn't phone. answer texts, and also life, and also COVID, and also just 
stuff, you know. It, it's hard to get a hold of him and nail him down for like a time to go out and spend time with him. Mm-hmm. But he's 24. This is... I, I was hard to nail down at 24. We went to get him a new phone and I had like... I budgeted... I uh, Before we went in, I was like, okay, I have like $300 to put towards a new phone for you. So anything over that, if there's something that, you know, you really want and it's over that, then you have to chip in. And he was perfectly fine with that. He has, he's like, honestly, I don't really care as long as it works and it doesn't have a cracked screen. I'm, I'm pleased good. to hear that it was perfectly all right with being given $300. Well, you know what I mean. But so we walk into T-Mobile because Sprint is now T-Mobile. And... um We get in there. He picks a phone out. The lady comes over and she's like, okay, I'm I'm just going to look and see what sort of promotions you have, you know, before we check out, see if we can get this phone for you a little bit cheaper. So she pulls him up and everything. And she's like, oh, dear God, (laughs) you can get a much better phone than this for free. Oh, nice. So he got a, a Google Pixel 6, which is a $600 phone for free. All I had to do was buy a case and a screen protector for him so that it won't crack it's because he honestly really doesn't care about technology that much and has had his old phone for like over four years so that was nice good and then we went to a couple of state sales and uh we went out for sushi and we had bubbling sake so i had alcohol for the first time in eight months for for lunch i was day drinking with my son because i'm the best mother in the world (laughs) <laughs> well, I don't know what I'm going to have to cut out of this <laughs> pre preamble because it's all gold. It is all gold. Oh, and at one of the estate, oh, done. At one of the estate sales, I managed to find a uh, last uh, copy of last year's People's Sexiest Man Alive issue with Paul Rudd as the sexiest man alive yeah, for, he... for Stelly. And when I gave it to her, she she squealed so loud. I was so happy to have bestowed such joy on my child i think we found the bit that i'm cutting <laughs> and then i took benny oh, for a haircut <laughs> it was an eventful day and then i took benny for a haircut. Interesting. <laughs> no and so our our beautiful long-haired child now has a faux hawk shall we preamble my dear how was your week we don't have time to talk about it now <laughs> was it fine sure <laughs> yes please give us some of that discounted Cory news This oh. is a Corey News special report. Oh, oh, oh. The British are coming. The British are coming. The British Soap Awards, that is. Oh, God. After a two, <laughs> after a two year hiatus, for some reason, they're back. And Coronation Street faves dominate the noms. <laughs> they include Best Family, The Allahans. You stopped day drinking, though, right? What? You stopped day drinking. Yes. Right. Best leading performer, Tino O'Brien. Really? Sally Carmen. Right. And Charlie fucking DeMello. Woo! You'll never guess who I voted for this morning. Anyway, best British soap, Coronation Street, obviously. Best dramatic performance, Sally Carmen. Best young performer, Jude Reardon. Best comedy performance, Jane Hazelgrove. Best Newcomer, Patty Beaver. Best On-Screen Partnership, Molly Gallagher and David Nielsen. Nice. Villain of the Year, <laughs> Maximus Evans. I give you Corey. Scene of the Year, Johnny's Death. Really? Yes, so there was death in there. Yeah, I kind of said the same thing. Best Storyline, Nina and Seb's Attack. The attack on Nina and Seb. Right, not not Nina and Seb attacking, people. right. Although that was very good as well. <laughs> Best single episode, Nina's flashback. Right. Yeah. I'm still trying to think of what uh, with S- with Sarah special did. with with special music guest Lizzo. Oh, Lizzo's on Coronation Street. <laughs> Excellent. What See, I'm, I'm rolling it all back on to Saturday Night Live. So what, well, that's what, what you're doing. What? <laughs> so you're having a stroke. So what do you think of those nominations, Gav? I'm confused about. Uh, no, I'm a I'm a Tino O'Brien fan, as you know. 
but I don't know why. I don't know why Sarah's got a norm. I, I guess because of the Adam stuff. The a- the Adam and and Lydia stuff. And Lydia stuff. I would not have thought so. I'm trying to think what else. I'm I'm actually quite confused why um why the hardest working actors in soap operas aka Ben Price and Jane Danson right. didn't get any nominee nominations although I suppose they were they became more sort of bit characters to storylines right. rather than having it driven through them I thankfully it, yeah I think it kind of it sucks one of the same reasons why it kind of sucks that it's been gone for two years and this was the case this has been the case with a, a number of awards shows like um with with the Oscars they kind of lumped in nominations for things that came out this year but were supposed to come out the year before and that kind of that's why you had a, a Pixar or a Disney song right. pitted against a bond song. You know, you you have all these storylines that that came to fruition in the past two years, and the ones from twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, ish, kind of got you know. There's just too much. Mm-hmm. But yeah, as as much as I like Tina O'Brien as well, I'm a little confused by that because besides the Adam storyline, I can't really think of anything. What we're gonna you, we're gonna. We're Are we gonna, missing something obvious here. We're we're gonna we're gonna be kicking ourselves in the ass later on when when we remember something or when John Giovanacci uh, reminds us. <laughs> in other news, I'm thrilled that the Alahans have been best family. That's, yeah, that's just that seems to be chef's nailed kiss. on, right? Chef's kiss. Uh, Mwah. And and yet Sally Carmen's always uh, there or thereabouts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. These days, so again, good to see. Kind of continued recognition for right. for what she did in the Seb storyline. Well, she carries the show so much on her shoulders, mm-hmm. you know, before handing it off which, occasionally. Which to has its issues. To let's, let's not ben be... Price and Jane Danson, but right, you know, right. But yeah, I think I think it's good to see these actors from these characters and these storylines being being recognised. It's been a long two years without yeah. the British Soap Awards. That was a very enthusiastic bit of Corey News. I think we all appreciated that. Thank you. Congratulations to everybody, you know, and I'm so happy to see Charlie up yeah, there and as he well. Was, he was very... He's very humble. Magnanimous about his Yes, he was. Uh, his because nomination. that's Charlie. Yeah. That's our Charlie. That's what he does. <laughs> but, you know, he was... He's got this big storyline going on right now. Mm-hmm. And then he had the whole Kelly trial stuff. So... That just, he's been kept busy. He's since, been kept very busy since Paula drowned in her business attire in that hot tub, <laughs> and got a job on Doctors. Yeah, yeah, and that's great news. Oh, just the one item. Well, it was it was a big item. It was a bumper item. It was a special report. <laughs> right, great news. Special report. This just in: the British are coming. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we the get British yeah, are yeah. coming. Okay, and then we'll podcast for coffee. <laughs> Listeners have been buying us coffees and therefore donating to charities for a year now. Woohoo! That's a year we've been doing that. Over this uh, first year, we've received over 150 coffees and donated more than 300 bucks to charity. So thank you to everyone who has ever contributed, some of you multiple times, all of you very generously, especially in these these times that we find ourselves in. Yes. So thank you. If you want to buy us next week's coffee, you can go to kofi.com. That's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. The talk of the street. Did anyone buy us a coffee this week? No. Otherwise I would have said so. Oh. And now it's Helen's favourite section. <laughs> it's new tubes. I don't know. Something about it just hurts my ears and the headphones. <laughs> It You're, doesn't bother me when I listen to the podcast as much as it does in my in my ears. 600 subscribers we've passed through this week. Woot woot! My target for the end of May is 1,000 subscribers. Yeah, we really need to get to that 1,000. And 500,000 views. How I've many said, views do we have right now? Uh, around about 300,000. Yeah. So, 
We're doing pretty well. Yeah. This is a section where we talk about what's new on our YouTube channel. We've got the regular stuff. We've got last week's podcast. We've got last night's Corey in under four minutes, which has proven to be very popular. And my three favourite clips from this week's episodes. And this week's extra content is Viva Blackpool. This is a superb cut of classic Corey episodes that saw Jack, Vera, Tyrone, Maria, Norris, Gary and the twins all head to Blackpool for some fun, sea and sand. What's not to love? A hour and a half of that. If that tickles your fancy, head over to Kofi. No, don't go to Kofi.com. Please don't. Or please do. Well, you but can then go there, go but to the then YouTubes. go to YouTube.com yeah. slash the Talk of the Street podcast. Smash that subscribe button and distribute nude photos of that notification bell. And now... Do we have our Kofi link on the YouTube front page? Yes. Okay, good. Of course we do. Well, sometimes. I'm a know. fucking amateur here. What, what yes. are you talking about? Like, I'm a fuck. Yes. This. <laughs> Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, welcome to Last Year Tonight with me, John Oliver. Just enough time to quickly talk about a Karahi intervention. Oh, this has to do with food. It, 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 food from Speed Doll. For? Ryan. That's right. This was Abby who stole Seb's curry. That's right. To force him to go and speak to... Speak to whom? <laughs> Nina. The look of fear on your face. Yeah, well, mine just went blank now. <laughs> Speak to Nina about going to the goth concert. Yes. I was Gavin and you weren't ready for the Oscars. Yeah, the Oscars were even later th- last year than they were this year, weren't they? Yeah, what is it? It's the first Sunday after the last full moon before the... That's when the Oscars is, isn't it? Right. Oh, before Easter. before, this, bef- Easter, before the sacrifice of... Rob Schneider and Polly Shore. Yes. They were once again nomination-free zones, by the way. Yeah. We bought Vogel.co.uk. <laughs> <laughs> it was a quiet but smelly week in Lake Wobegon because the tree in our yard was in blossom. Yeah, it's not It's it's not yet. It's <laughs> slowing down this year. Yeah. Our pre-preamble was largely taken up with chat about Oscar-nominated movies that you hadn't seen and things that smelled of semen. We like sta- our tree. Yeah. We started to speculate that Ruby's lover would be involuntarily harvested for Peter. Poor Ruby. That's when, that's what exactly what you said. I like say it that. every time. Oh, poor Ruby. Poor Ruby. You had given up on Tyrone ever wearing his MSU shirt. You thought there was going to be a conflict because it was a trademarked image. Right, yeah, of Sparty. Craig's unlikely fledgling career on the CID is in the balance as Faye and Gary's sentencing day looms. That's still so confusing to me, the whole CID thing. And then it's, and, then ha- and then and then he says one line about, oh, it didn't pan out. And that's the end of it. Right. It still confuses me. Peter is still alive and his good news doesn't stop there as a friendly nurse lets him know that he's officially on the transplant list. Woohoo! Poor, poor Ruby. <laughs> Sharon Bentley, a former foster child of Rita's, shows up after an absence of more than two decades, which is a cue to talk about lots of characters who hadn't been in classic Corey for five years. Nina thinks about taking her relationship with Seb to the next level until Paul, Ed, a plastic bag and a curly whirly make her reconsider. Kathy is becoming a little too comfortable at Yasmin's and is getting her money's worth out of the Amazon Prime free shipping. ITV Corey finally gets his wicked way with Asha, but thanks to Addy, still leaves with his nose out of joint. Tyrone treats Alina to a night away at the M6's Premier Motorway Hotel while Chesney does his best to knacker the washing machine at number 9. Gemma balances snacks on her boobs. Hope goes berserker. Dev keeps the luxury crisps in the sideboard. Our moment of the week was Addy punching ITV Corey square in the face. Woohoo! And we love boring, that kid. Yeah, and our boring moment of the week was Gary playing hide and seek. And that was Coronation Street and the talk of the street, this time last year. Yes. You want to dive in? Our first storyline this morning is Summer Slam. On Monday... Amy pops round to visit Summer, which obviously worries Summer, who insists once Billy leaves that she's not going to make herself sick and she doesn't need babysat, thank you very much. Amy claims to just enjoy Summer's company, which can't possibly be true. <laughs> Jacob pops round later announcing to Amy that the rent is due and he's only been able to scrape together 60 quid. He asks if Amy can get an advance on her wages and she's like, I don't think that's a good idea because my, my boss is my mum. Yeah. So he yeah, agrees. And he needs money for the for the lucky bill as well. Yes. <laughs> 
face that worth a, a, a butt head <laughs> <laughs> just lucky lucky yeah for electric yep <laughs> it's just see this it, is an informative podcast it's, it's funny to me and it's a bit charming and it's very british it is very british so he goes off to find the money from somewhere else and he goes into devs and learns that Evelyn has ordered uh, too many Alka Pops. So he offers to take the surplus off her hands for 60 quid. Evelyn negotiates 10% off the profits. Yes. And they agree. So he's selling his Alka Pops on the street and doing a roaring trade. That's the rent sorted. Amy mentions that Summer is looking a bit pale and is worried that she's been vomiting again, which is doing Summer's head and back all the way off, shouts Summer. So Amy leaves her to it. Meanwhile, across the street, Simon's on the phone to the cops, grassing up Jacob and his little sideline. What a prick. Right, yeah, and he's being he's very being very dick Oh, there's there's this shady character and it looks like he's selling something, but I can't tell what it is. It looks like it might be drugs. Right, yeah. When I mean, it's obviously not. Yeah, because it's in a big box that says alcohol pops on it. Right. I mean technically alcohol is is a drug, but w- Yeah, stay that's in school. Not, that's, that's not what Simon is implying. Stay in school, kids. Later, Jacob moves his boxes into the community garden where Summer is looking a bit drunk. Jacob is concerned until Evelyn asks how he's getting on and then he sees that the cops are turning up and so he legs it. Right, and Evelyn helps him. Evelyn's like, fly boy, fly! (laughs) I just, can we just take a moment to appreciate, appreciate Evelyn in all of this? Yeah, she's great. You know, doing this deal with Jacob, helping the kid out, you know, and with a benefit to her. And not at any moment reminding him that he used to be a drug dealer and why should she trust him? Blah, 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 like everybody else in the street. Oh, that's Kudos true. Kudos for Evelyn. Yeah, because she was, she was on the phone to the, the uh, distribution company uh-huh. to try and get the Alka Pops back and right. seemingly was talking to an idiot. Right. So this seemed to be the path of less resistance for her was just to offload them onto right. this guy. Probably making a loss on that 60 quid as it turns out, but... Anyway. Yeah. And also, you know, and Addy also is, you know, he's talking to Jacob like he's a human being and not a monster. Yeah. And that's nice, too. Yeah. It's nice that a few people on the street treat Jacob like he's more than just what he used to be. Agreed. Yes. The cops find Summer looking pished out of her tits in the community garden, surrounded by Alka Pops. They assume that she's wasted and so take her down the station. But not like that. Can you explain about Alka Pops? And what they are to our listeners who may not be familiar with them. Hard lemonade. Yeah, it's like Mike's hard lemonade. Right. Yeah. It's a, a very sweet, a very uh, soda pop kind of flavour, mm-hmm. but typically high in alcohol content, so right. it gets you wasted pretty quick. Yes. Like a uh, hooch. Hooch was uh, the big one when I was growing up that was alcoholic lemonade and alcoholic uh, orangeade and stuff like that. Right. Or like Mad Dog 2020. Sort of stuff. But fizzy. Yes. Very fizzy. Very fizzy. Eczema. Yeah, I remember the first the first time I ever had Mad Dog 2020 <laughs> was the orange one. Uh huh. And it was the last day of work before Christmas. And somebody had brought a bottle in <laughs> into work. <laughs> of course they did. This is Scotland. And so I'd passed it about and I had one one uh coffee machine cup uh uh-huh. off it. And I just felt drunk from the feet up from one cup of it. Yeah. And it's not that strong, but it just goes right to your head. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Amy learns from Simon about the filth left in summer for being pished and quickly deduces that this is all because Simon has grasped up Jacob again. She and Addy head off to the police station to sort this fucking mess out. And hopefully Simon realises that he's never going to get his hole. Right. Well, Kelly doesn't know, so maybe. So Amy and Addy get to the cop shop and tell PC Tinker that Summer has been lifted for being drunk, but she's probably heading for a diabetic coma or something. So PC Tinker bursts into action, runs to the cell where Summer is locked up right. and sees her passed out and raises the alarm. Right. Like nobody has, like there's no CCTV in that cell and nobody's noticed that this girl is just like completely fallen over. I nobody's think, questioning I don't think you're allowed her. allowed to have a CCTV in that cell probably, but I'm more worried about why the police have thrown her into a cell if she's that age and if she is drunk as they think. Uh-huh. That they haven't called her parents. Or or given her a breathalyzer test right. or something. Right, yeah, try to sober her up a little. 
or something. It's it's like it's like they've just thrown her in the drunk tank to dry it's exactly, out. It's yeah. Exactly what they've done. And she's not Barney Gumble from right. from the Simpsons. No, at least I don't think so. No, she belches a little less. Right, just a little. <laughs> so her she shirts go- fit her better. So she goes to the right. She goes to the <laughs> hospital and she's recovered and she's sitting up and she's ready to go home which allows Billy to rub his hands together in a relieved way rather than a worried way. Right, yes. Someone had blamed the incident on skipping lunch. Yes, because the hospital, let's remember, is a magic hospital where people are cured almost immediately and then Mm -hmm. go home. Yeah. The doctor tells her that she needs to keep on top of this situation a bit better. Back home now, Billy is making a pot pie. You think Summer's dad would be appalled at his attempts at parenting. From now on, he's going to be totally on top of her eating and her meds. Oh, pig's tits, says Summer. Mm Mm-hmm. Later, Simon tries to apologise to Amy, but Amy is having none of it. Yeah. He fucks off as Billy appears with some raspberries. <coughs> for dessert. <laughs> don't know why that tickled me. <laughs> Billy thanks her for her help and then starts... the little hairs on the raspberries that are tickling you. Right. Mm. Ooh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. Something wrong with this cream. <laughs> and then Billy starts blaming himself. For all this mess, Amy tells him to go easy on himself. So Billy realizes that some- like that. there's something going on here that he doesn't know about, and he asks Amy to spill. So she does. Summer's binging and purging, and she might be bulimic. Billy is shocked and disappointed that she doesn't realize the danger that she's putting herself in, and also that Summer's talking to Amy and not talking to him. Correct. Like every other child in the world. Right. Yeah. Billy gets home. Billy gets home like a hen in a hot girdle and Summer quickly deduces that he's been talking to Amy. Have you been making yourself sick, he asks. And when she doesn't answer, she kind of answers. He tells her that she could have gone into a coma and she could have died. Tearfully, she says she wants to stop, but she doesn't think that she can. Billy calls her a magnificent young lady, but diabetes is a big deal. This is a card she's been dealt and she needs to deal with it. Summer hates being different. She just wants to fit in. Is that Summer? That she just wants to fit in? I don't think Summer 1.0 was somebody who was desperate to fit in. Yeah, I would say, yeah, Summer 1.0 just... but March to the beat of her own drum. Right, but in fairness... Let's say Summer 2.0. This, and this is Summer at an older age, you know? There are, True. You know, there are things that our kids did and were into when they were little and didn't have a care in the world what people thought about it. And they now kind of care about what people think about certain things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this is adolescence. True. So she hated herself and she felt guilty for doing it and worried about it. She hates all of this and she's let Billy down. He admits to be worrying himself sick, but promises to get her through this and get her some professional help. And they share a tearful hug. And that was a lovely scene. It was. My one complaint about, about it is the fact that it was chopped up. That we didn't see this whole conversation play out in one, in one scene. Yeah, and they they cut it. At, it wasn't really strange parts, but it was parts where they could have quite easily gone on. Yeah, it hadn't reached an emotional crescendo yet. It was you know sometimes they they reach that, those little pinnacles and then they'll mm-hmm. cut it there and they'll come back to it and yeah. But it didn't feel like it was doing that. It felt no. like it was it was still building towards something. Right, and then all of a sudden end. we go to Gary and Kelly, and it's like. Toya. Right. It's like, can we please just stay on this mm-hmm. for the duration of this conversation? It makes me wonder if when the scene was written initially, if it was intended for the way Coronation Street used to be with in two blocks. Oh, no, I don't think it was. I don't think it, it, it crossed over a commercial break. Well, uh, not not in filming, but I'm wondering if in writing it was done that way. Oh, who knows? In you know, but who knows? I I just frankly would have appreciated because when you do that, it's like a commercial break, yeah, where you're losing some of the emotional pull of the conversation. Yeah, you're asked to care about this, and now you're asked to care about that, and then back to this again. Yeah, yeah. Stop doing that. We know you listen. Well, this is something that I try to do in my, <laughs> my core in under four minutes. Right. Let's put all that stuff together. You can't put it all together, no. right? Because that would be very weird. But 
Anyway, on Wednesday, Billy has called a meeting of the Council of the Exes at Nina's Rolls, except Sean, to tell him all about Summer and her eating disorder. In uh, fairness, Sean was never seen as a parental figure for Summer. No. And Todd and No, but it looked Paul. like Billy was just some of these exes. Right. Than... Todd and Paul are both... It's Summer's three dads. My three dads. Yeah. Yes, my three dads. After they get where this time, they're all gay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they're not like Greg Evigan, who was my favourite. Right, see, in the American version of My Two Dads, they were both straight. Yeah, Greg Evigan. Yeah. He was the beardy one. Yeah, they were both straight, though. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. They, they really... There wasn't a British My Two Dads. No. There wasn't? No. That surprises me. After... Really? I would have thought that they would have made My Two Dads a British version, and they would both be gay. I feel like we're kind of getting <laughs> getting trapped in the quagmire of this, this discussion. Mm. After they get over the shock, Billy asks them to keep an eye on what she eats, when she eats, and if she vomits it back up again. Summer comes in and insists that she's fine and she doesn't need looking after, but Todd instantly goes off in the deep end. Addy meets Summer in the community garden and they share some nice banter about her eating disorder and his being left to die in a flaming car. Addy thinks it's nice that people seem to care about her. So Todd rushes out on Nina's rolls and then comes straight back in when Shona's serving this time and asks her to keep him notified of everything that she sells to Summer but to keep it on the hush-hush. And then Addy comes in, and Todd is quick to speak to him too. And I realise now that I've completely forgotten to mention that Billy was serving at Nina's roles when he summoned the Council of the Exes. Right, yeah. Like, Roy just gives the shop over to whoever needs to have a serious conversation. Does this apron fit? Then you can serve at Nina's roles. But this is the first of many meetings that happen in the cafe this week where... Where we raise an eyebrow. Yeah, and maybe there was a better place to have this right, conversation. Yes. Summer goes to Dev's and starts loading up on biscuits and pastries and stuff. And Addy is made of concern, but she insists it's for the local food bank, where mm-hmm. she's got the money for this donation, I don't know. Billy probably gave her money and said, go get some snacks for the food thing. Addy thinks that she's going to give homeless people diabetes. Todd storms into Billy's flat to confront Summer. He's got a tip off that she was buying things from Dev's. What are these things? Come on, what, where are you hiding them? Or have you eaten all of them already? All the things? Are they all gone? And he starts raking through her bag. What's going on? Bellows Billy as he comes into the flat. He surely could have expected a call from Todd rather than walking in on right. a diabetic version of the Spanish Inquisition. Right, yeah. It's like... It- you would think Todd, the adult in this situation, would call Billy and say, hey, you know, I'm concerned because I just found out that she bought a whole bunch of stuff from Addie. And Billy could have confirmed, yes, it was for the food bank. Right. And none, it, none of this comedy of errors, which isn't funny at all, would occur. Someone explains it was for the food bank and Billy backs it up. You can't control me. You're not my dad. And you just <laughs> fuck everything and everyone up. And she calls him toxic. Billy throws Todd out, even though Billy is at least partially to blame for all this. (laughs) Because he said, monitor what she's eating, when she's eating, and that she's vomiting it back up again. Keep an eye on her. Yeah, but at least Billy said, when she's with you. Not, you know, sneak around town and, you know, blab to everybody. Plus, imagine asking Todd to do anything. (laughs) I like the fact that we we are led to assume that that Paul is the cool dad here. Yeah, because we don't see him again. Right, who is concerned and loving, like when Summer walks in on this, you know, conference of dads. Mm-hmm. But the, the Council of the Exes, given it its proper name. Well, I prefer it's. I prefer the conference of dads <sighs> because that should be our focus here: is that they're all dads to Summer. Not oh, that I suppose so. They've all slept with Billy, <laughs> including Billy. <laughs> Billy slept with Billy? Billy slept with himself, yes. And he called himself a man of the cloth. (laughs) The man of the the man of the sports sock. (laughs) And it all comes back to our yard again. Which isn't smelling of that. No, no, it's not blossoming yet. Our yard does not smell of semen at the moment. (laughs) Later. Or if it is, it's not from the tree. Wait, I didn't. Did I finish making my point? I, I can't, can't even remember. remember what my point was. 
<laughs> but Paul's the cool dad yeah. that he's not going around and asking people to spy on her. Yeah. Later, Summer thinks that she has a house herself, so she gets wired into a pack of, I think it was chocolate hobnobs. Yeah, we have some of those in our cupboard. Oh, they're so good. They are good. When Billy comes in and catches her, she's sorry, it was just a stress, a fucking Todd and everything. No one understands. Billy promises, like he did on Monday, to give her the help that she needs. I thought hobnobs was an interesting choice, because they are kind of healthy. They've got fibre in them. Oats. Yeah. Or was it digestives? It was either chocolate digestives or chocolate hobnobs. Maybe I was just thinking it was chocolate hobnobs because I was eating a chocolate hobnob at the time. <laughs> They're so good. And see when you haven't had them stuff too. in five years, one chocolate hobnob, it's just not enough. No. And these are the ones that have, you know, crossed crossed the ocean. Right. So they're slightly less fresh than the ones you would buy. Yeah, they didn't float the across. They were in no. a container of some nature, I would imagine. On Friday, Billy is still threatened over someone and has taken matters into his own hands. Fuck her exams, fuck her revision, and fuck Oxford. She needs to get help, and so he signed her up for a diabetes eating disorder wants to go to the Oxford support group thing. Her health has to come first. And he's right. Yep. Yeah. He, he and, puts his foot and, down, finally. And also, this just continues the whole, how much revision do you have to do if you're a smart kid? Yep. At the diabetes eating disorder wants to go to Oxford support group thing, Summer sits next to Brett Michaels from Poison, who thinks that this is a sex addicts group for <laughs> lactose intolerant people who want to go to Cambridge. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm exactly like you, he says, and he explains how the group works, putting Summer at ease. Of course, Brett Michaels famously does have diabetes. That's why I said it. <laughs> Summer and Brett Michaels from Poison have got on famously at the group and they arrange to keep in touch and attend the next meeting together. So much for revision. Billy is creepy as fuck as he smiles at the door as he watches Summer and Brett Michaels from Poison flirt with each other. And that's as far as we get with that story this week. He is a foot and a half taller than her. Yeah, it's so cute. It reminds me of me and my first husband. I knew you were going to say that. Of course you do. You're my husband now. He's a tall man. He's six foot six, my ex-husband. And you are? Five four. <laughs> there you go. Oh well. How, how tall are you, Gav? Five. Well, I was 5'11". I think I might be 5'10 now. Are you shrinking? I think we all shrink, don't we? don't think so. Not until, like, we're all bent over in our 80s. 5'11", 5'10", that kind of thing. That kind of area. So you're still taller than me, but not creepily so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Finally, we have some real light in this storyline for Summer as we have, I, th I think his name's Aaron. Is it Aaron? The Brett Michaels from Poison guy? I think that's his name. Sure. A little I thought romantic, it started with a J again, but maybe not. A little romantic interest yes. that is maybe, maybe he's not Curtis and maybe he's not John, so maybe he's not faking that he's got diabetes and maybe he's not planning on moving to Australia in the next two weeks. Maybe. Yeah, it's nice. And we need more young people on the show. Do we? We need more young men, I think. Not enough to go around. Because you know nobody's going to date Simon. <laughs> Poor Simon. Poor Simon. He's never getting his hole. No, I thought that was nice that that was how we decided to end the week. Because it was fairly grim yes. for, for long periods of... Um, and like images of the spoilers with, you know, Craig bent over... Summer's prone body in that cell with Yikes. all the lighting looked, you know, devastating. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that I'm glad that that's not what we choose to focus on. How do we think about uh, Billy's decision to tell Todd and Paul about it? it? Seemed a little well. It seemed like this is her thing to tell if she wanted to tell them, and she clearly didn't. Well. Let's remember, the only reason why Billy knows is because of Amy, not because of Summer. Summer just confirms it. Summer, yeah, Summer wasn't going to tell anybody until... Summer, yeah. And this is the sort of thing, if you don't tell people, she could die. And I think that's kind of why Amy finally told Billy, is that Summer ended up in the hospital. Summer was a good friend. Remember last week, she looked like she was going to be a good friend, and then she wasn't... You mean Amy was a good friend? Who did I say? You said Summer. <laughs> At least I didn't say Faye. No, it's true. Amy was a good friend. Because Faye is never a good friend. No. <laughs> Faye is the worst friend you could have. <laughs> Amy, though, yes. was a good friend. Amy's always a good friend. All right. Yeah. No, I um, I don't mind it. 
I, I'm still a little questioning of how we've just all just decided to forgive Todd for when all of this the happen? machinations and accept him back into the family. Because remember, the last time Summer was sick or something was going on with Summer and Paul was there, but not Todd. And I said to you, I'm surprised Todd's not here as well. And you were like, well, nobody's forgiven him yet because he's an awful person. And I was kind of like, yeah, but he is a he is seen as a parental figure to Summer. So you would think that he would be concerned about her health. Mm -hmm. So and so I can. It's nice because the three of them are very different men and have very different points of view as to life, as well as to raising this child that all three of them care about very much, right. you know, and I think if they could get their act together, they could be a very good team. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like, like a, a the league, three of them, a right. league maybe a league of gentlemen fathers. Right. Yes. Leagues even better than council. Yes. Or, or conference. Mm. Yeah. So, well, I, so I don't mind it. To answer your question. Let's move on into our next little thing this morning, which is, what's, what's it all about, Alfie? On Monday at the flat. We get to see him this week. Kinda. On Monday, no, we proper see him. I must not have been looking at my screen at the yeah, time. Yeah, we get to proper see him. At the flat, Toya has noticed that Imran's got a missed call from someone called Ben, which spurs Imran to remember that he has some business to take care of outside that's totally unrelated to that call on the scuv. Man meets on a Ben holiday. But this Ben character and confirms his brief. He's to dig as much dirt as possible on Abby Webster to prove she's back on the muck. In the rovers, Imran explains his deal with Ben and how he's finding dirt on Abby. Toya thinks this is too much, but Imran says he's only finding evidence of stuff they already know. Right. Toya is unconvinced and threatens to make the relationship with Abby more toxic. She doesn't threaten to make the relationship more toxic. No. She thinks that doing this is going to make the relationship more toxic. Correct. So Imran agrees to call Ben off. Meanwhile, Elliot meets with Abby and Roy and Nina's roles because he's not got an office for her to go to and she can't invite him to her flat because reasons. So in public, And also, apparently, Roy is involved in this now. Why is he sitting at that table? Why is he sitting there? Why does Abby... It seems like Abby has asked him to sit down and like be a friend or something, but... This doesn't feel like something Roy would be involved in. What's he getting in? involved in this for? Just because he went round and bought her cider last week? I guess, but also Roy is not the type of person who would be okay with some of the stuff Elliot is saying. No. And yet he doesn't say anything about how it's wrong what Elliot is saying. It takes something else happening for us to acknowledge that the, what Elliot is saying is wrong. So in public, they discuss improving Abby's chances of getting custody by implying that Imran deliberately did a shitty job representing her due to his conflicts of interest. Toya comes in and she overhears us because they're in public. Right. And she says what we're all thinking. How is any of this your fucking business, Roy? And also, that would be a lie. That would be a it? lie. And Imran acted in good faith. Yes. Roy tries to get involved again and Toya tells him to back off. All they're doing is trying to make sure Alfie gets the best start in life. Abby insists that she would give Alfie the best start in life. And this gives everyone a good laugh and lightens the mood, releases the tension, and Toya goes off with a smile on her face and a skip in her step. <laughs> Toya gets home and explains about the plot she overheard at the cafe. Toya is now balls deep into the idea of playing dirty now. Fuck them. Fuck them all. Yes. Later in the trolls, Abby gets to chat with Evelyn about Alfie and Imran's dirty tricks. Evelyn urges calm and then mentions that it's just a shame that, as Alfie is obviously loved by everyone, that there can't be a joint custody arrangement. And this gets Abby sucking a thoughtful tooth. Kind of, kind of what, you know, Imran was trying to say to her last week when she was blindsided because apparently the courts were open on Good Friday. Yeah. Bad log. <sighs> so stupid. But anyway, um, when, when he said, look, this is the best chance of us being able to keep him and not being put in care for me to go for custody now, but that wouldn't really matter because you'd still be yeah. just as involved in his life. But she didn't take it that way because she was blindsided because the courts were open on Good Friday. Yeah, everyone was surprised by that. Yes. Particularly you. Yes, and, and Mercy Tart. <laughs> Imran and Toya visit Alfie when Abby comes in and calls her truce. She's done with all this feuding and a fussing. She doesn't want Alfie deprived of his dad or his dad's partner. 
Alfie needs a calm mum and that's what she's going to be. She goes off for a coffee and we find that Imran and Toya aren't buying this act for a second and decide to plough on with the Ben plan. It's so ridiculous. And then we've got a little uh, side storyline about the, the law office business that we'll, I'm just going to cover now. So earlier on the Monday, Adam, Sarah and Harry are having breakfast in Nina Rolls. Sarah is disappointed because after all the bother they've had recently, what with Adam falling from the mezzanine level of a mall and having eye surgery, their practice is going through a rocky patch, so he has to put in some hours today on a bank holiday. Hmm. I can't believe you have to work on a fucking bank holiday, says Sarah. You said fucking, shouts Harry. (laughs) And Adam (laughs) wags his finger at Sarah. Oh, God, that was so funny. I mean, obviously he says flipping, she says flipping, but... The fact that Her- the way Harry reacts to the word flipping, he goes, <gasps> does he want does does he not watch an excessive amount of HGTV in his <laughs> spare time to become immune to the word flip? It took a long time, but we got there. <laughs> yeah, Harry has uh, one volume, and it's one hundred and fifty percent exuberant. <laughs> yes, I love him. Soft play. Why would Adam come to my birthday party? And now we have, you said flipping to add on to that. You said flipping! Later, Adam is just about to finish up for the day when a new client comes in who has already left plenty of messages and refuses to come back tomorrow. You better take a seat then, says Adam. Hmm. And he has to phone Sarah and apologise for missing the picnic that they had planned. There's a loopy fucking woman appeared who can't stop crying for five seconds to explain what the fuck she wants, says Adam. And the woman can hear every word. Right, there's something to do with her father's death or something? She lost her job because she had cancer or something. Or, no, her dad had cancer and she had to take care of him. And that, yeah, illegal. Illegal. Illegal dad cancer? Illegal to fire someone. Oh. Well, it would be illegal here because of... Because workers have no rights. On Wednesday, Ben goes to see Inman with his initial findings about Abby. Nothing. Yeah. She looks straight as a die. Ben offers to manufacture some evidence for Imran, but Imran tells him just to keep an eye on uh, things and keep it all above board for now. And he's also really shocked that Ben is looking into Abby's finances and her social media. Right. Like, what century are you living in, Imran? And what social media has Abby got? Remember, she has 12 contacts on her phone, six of which begin with... Oh, was it C. Was it C? I don't know. On Friday at the law office, Adam and Imran bemoan the lack of business, all thanks to Lydia. Imran admits to taking his eye off the ball, what with Alfie, and he offers to go and leave the business and uh, and give Adam some uh, financial ease by doing this. But Adam's having none of it. Then Imran gets a text from Ben asking to meet somewhere secure, like Nina (laughs) Rolls. So Ben and Imran meet in Nina Rolls, and Imran insists that he needs proof that Abby is back on the muck. Ben says that he needs to be patient or he needs to move to plan B. But Imran remains set on keeping the stuff legal for now. For now. And that's as far as we get with that. Imran's determination to keep this above board, but it's, it kind of feels a little bit in conflict, at least to Adam and now to- Adam, Imran and Toya's now insistence right. that Abby is back on the muck, despite right. no real proof of that. None. Right, it's like he's so driven by the idea that she's not, that he can't be wrong. Not the only man on the street this week who makes bad decisions because he insists he can't be wrong. But it's kind of shocking to see that from Imran being so toxic. We don't, we don't think of him as being this way and would, again i think be, you know it's the same thing as we were talking about last week is that we give imran an awful lot of a pass because charlie is a good human being yeah i think i would be okay with him being suspicious mm-hmm. he saw after raking through a right. bin, he, he found the bottle of right, morphine yeah. that was empty she denies it mm-hmm. i think he has to take her at her word right at least and maybe have a healthy amount of suspicion about it mm-hmm. and keep an eye on it. But he's determined that he's right, that she yes. is definitely back on the mark. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he seems to be all in on this right. very, very easily. And so is Toya. Yeah. 
And it's because of Alfie, you know, this is not behavior that we would have. And because of the fact that they have now officially lost Elsie. Yeah. She's not coming back, you know, so they're both so. And, and also because, and also for Imran, it's not just Alfie, it's Toya. Because the only way he got Toya back yeah, it's a was whole to farm use Alfie. Thing, right? Yeah. So he's so focused on keeping his family that he's willing to do something that he would never do otherwise and would never have done before he became a father, which is throw Abby under the bus. Yeah, completely under the bus. Right. Do you think, do you believe Toya's motivations here? Because I'm not sure. I have seen, I have seen speculation that she's playing Imran for a fool as well. And honestly, it, it, to me, that doesn't feel like that's in keeping with who Toya is. It doesn't. And the conversation she had with Leanne kind of pushed me away from that a little bit because that seemed to be coming from a place of honesty. But and yes, there's I just know, something about being bitten so many times by right. Imran and the same lie coming back time and time again that makes me think. And yes, yes, I know that she did pretend to be pregnant with Peter and pretend to have a baby with Peter. And the baby was actually her sister's. I, so I, I do know and I recognize that Toya has been devious when it comes to babies in the past. She has a baby fever, yeah. But it did seem after that storyline when all of the truth came out and she lost her relationship with Peter, that she did change. She did grow from that situation. She did acknowledge that what she did was wrong and she seemed to move away from it. Last week she said that she doesn't need him to fix her right and she doesn't need a baby to be happy right so it, it did feel like she'd kind of moved on a little bit i'm just still a little worried that she's she's playing a game here just a little bit yeah because Imran has been such a shit yeah right our next through line this morning is one down one to go on Monday, Kelly and Maria are sitting on a bench talking about having vegetable lasagna for tea when Beth comes over, flapping the paper round that has a picture that, from the funeral mm -hmm. of the fight of Gary and that bloke. Right. Maria's mortified, but then never mentions it again. But Kelly comes to her aid a little bit. Yes. And says to Beth, if you were 10 years younger, you'd still be an old bag. Yes. <laughs> and also, you enjoy, you know, you enjoy other people's misery and beth is like oh it's only a joke i was only joking and it's like no no kelly finally holds beth accountable mm -hmm. for her gob yep and that's lovely you know and i i just wish kelly had been around later in another storyline when beth is also flapping her gob yeah because this this has no impact on her taking stock of of how she behaves and what she says no. it, it doesn't it bounces off her immediately right in fairness in that other storyline it, it's it unlike this it's something she actually kind of has something to do with tangentially right. but still it's nice to see somebody hold beth accountable because we don't get to see that very often people will just kind of just go oh it's only beth right and ignore it and beth she, is horrible this week yep she is such a bitch Meanwhile, Gary, Paul and Ed are ready to get working on Rick the Chin's house. Apparently there's been a burst pipe or something, so they're going right. to have to lift the floorboards. Yeah, uh, well, it's in the upper, like on the top floor. So they have to lift stuff and I think they have to fix the roof or something. And they're not long at the site before Ed and Paul have some interesting news for Gary. They've lifted some of the damaged floorboards and underneath they found an undamaged sports bag filled with undamaged £20 notes. Yes. To the to the to the tune of seventeen grand was worth. Yeah, I saw some commentary on Twitter that uh, amused me that they looked like new twenty pound notes that uh -huh. came into circulation in twenty twenty, uh -huh. a year after Rick the Chin died. Yeah, <laughs> who fucking cares? <laughs> That's fun though, isn't it? Who cares? Well, I'd be it's quite like you know, I'd be like, quite pleased with myself if I'd noticed it's, that. It's like complaining about wallpaper being where tiles should be. Yeah, well, I would have enjoyed complaining about that too. <laughs> People on Twitter can be so pedantic that you, that's about what you, Steve Martin. That's what you sign up for. It's in the terms <laughs> and conditions. So Gary and Maria explained to Kelly about the big bag of cash that they found. There's 17 grand in there and it's all hers. 
Kelly wants nothing to do with it, but Gary and Maria say that she could put it to some good use, like for uni costs or a deposit on a house or something. Kelly still isn't impressed, so Maria says they'll look after it for her for now, and off camera they discuss ways to launder the money back into the banking system. Hmm. Except they don't. No. Later in the evening, we see Kelly with the sports bag heading to the tram station alone. Yes. Then on Wednesday, it's Laura's funeral today. Kelly's getting herself ready. Maria reminds her that they are there for her if she needs anything. But the only thing that Kelly needs is for Gary not to lamp anyone at this funeral. Please. Fair dues, says Gary. And we don't get to see Laura's no, funeral. No, we don't. And I'm that's furious a fucking about that. disgrace. We get to see Rick the Chins. Right. He's been dead for three years. Right. And nobody cares. Right. Here's Laura, a character that we've just lost, who we were emotionally attached to at the yeah, end. Yeah, I like Laura. She, she kept a flame under Gary's ass. It was She good. did. It was great. But no, we only see them come home in their funeral clothes. That, that oh, was a travesty. I'm so disappointed in that. Very much so. Anyway, we're left to assume that she's stuffed in a plastic bag and thrown out with the non-recyclables. Oh, Gary no. offers to get uh, himself arrested by putting all that cash into the bank for Kelly, but she doesn't want to talk about it right now. And so Gary's forced to leave it. Where has she gone with that cash? Has I she given it to that bloke from the funeral? I, th- I think she has been distributing it to that bloke and other people who Rick the Chin has been has swindled in his life. Because remember, that's what she said. She wanted to give money back to the people that had been harmed by her dad. So that's what she's done, a veritable Robin Hood of the 21st century. That's that's my speculation, yes. And she's keeping it secret from Gary because... No one's noticed that this bag's not there anymore. Or if it is, it's empty. Gary would be appalled, I think. He's kind of did something similar himself, though. Yes. He gave people their passports back. Right, yeah. Stopped charging them money and I think, wrote off a lot of loans. And yeah, things. I think Gary would be appalled because I think Gary, for Gary, the person who's been hurt the most by Rick the Chin is Kelly. So Kelly should keep the money and not feel so guilty. Yeah. But it's nice that she's potentially assuaging, you know, what she feels is guilt right. for her parents. And, you know, and she's of an age where she would still feel guilt for her parents. It, it takes many many years to sit back and say you know what the bad things my parents did in their lives are not my fault and so i shouldn't carry it around on my shoulders anymore right do good with something that was born out of bad right if breaking bad has taught us nothing else it's laundering large amounts of money like this isn't as easy as you no as you might no look at poor zidane where is he (laughs) where's alia Alia was in that a couple of weeks ago with a with was a party. She, was she? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes, and she was back working. Was didn't didn't Yasmin fire both of them and tell them they could never darken the doors of Speed Doll again? No, because they own part of it, so they she couldn't. They just she just kicked them out of the house. The Where is grand- homeless stew? Where is homeless stew and his fabulous hair? Is it Yasmin's? She, yeah, she's got a. Locked in a room or something so he can't work at Speed Doll anymore. Right. The portrait of Homeless Stew. He's <laughs> up in the attic. The 17th. 17- with, with, with Tim's dad's magic box. <laughs> Ooh. That 17 grand has to go through the furniture thing, presumably. One would think. But the way that she's doing it is but okay because. Busy week that you've done 17 grand's worth of business and. Yeah, he would, he would have had to have fallen into. I love that scene in Breaking Bad where she's got the, Skylar's got the, spoiler alert for Breaking Bad, (laughs) she's got the storage unit. A show that ended five years ago. That's just full of cash. Yeah. She has no idea how much is there. Right. And it'll take forever to put it through the car wash that they've got. Uh Uh-huh. So it's a smaller problem that that Gary would have that it seems to be, oh, I'll just take this down the bank and try and put 17 grand into a bank that isn't going to raise any red flags anymore. Well, her dad's just died, so it could be like, oh, we just, you know. It's part of her inheritance. None of that is in cash. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, but again, it's not easy. I think I think what she's doing is a much better way. I mean, she's not laundering the money. They're not going to give it back to her. No. She, she's not going to do services for them, like wash their car or something and no. then pay it back to her. No. But this way, 
you she know. just gets rid of it. Yeah. And that's... And it's somebody and she's else's still problem. The, and she's still got the 380000 of In smaller bites, yes. And she's got all this legal money. So it's no big deal. That that was the thing that really confused me, is that Gary's like, oh, you should keep this money. You could use it for other stuff. And it's like, she has three hundred and eighty grand mm -hmm. already. What is seventeen grand going to do on top of that that she can't do already? Right. If you've got half a million dollars... I think she's fine. You could maybe just throw that seventeen grand on a horse. And also, you know... Remember, Ed suggested that Gary take the money to the police. Yeah. Because it's dodgy money. Yep. Yeah, so they're not going to squeal. Right, yeah. I thought it was very interesting, that shot of, that, that zoomed in shot where Gary takes a couple stacks of money out of Ed's hands and put it back in the bag. I found that a very interesting and not at all ominous and foreshadowy shot there to... You know, maybe Ed and Paul. And are we saying that Ed and Paul wouldn't have skimmed a little out of that? Well, see, this is the thing. 17 grand, really? There was 17 grand? That seems like an odd number of grands to have in there. Did, is, is there three grand in, in Ed's back pocket at the moment? Yeah, it's like going to the, the store to buy three tins of beer. Right. Why would you buy three? Well, if you only have two friends. No, yeah, you'd buy a four pack. At least... Well, then who gets the fourth tin? You just drink that as well. <laughs> and your friends get nothing. That's right. Bring your own fucking beer if you're coming to my house. Oh. Moving on then to our next storyline. This is the second storyline that is named after a WWE pay-per-view. Or are we talking about the Royal Undertaker? Royal Rumble, yeah. On Wednesday, The Undertaker and Eileen are chatting about arrangements for tonight. He wants to go out, but she wants a quiet night in and invites him to stay over. And the expression just freezes on his face at the idea. Yeah. Which is weird, because I thought for sure he has spent the I mean, night before. I kind of thought he was staying there, to be honest with you. <laughs> Later, the Undertaker is heading off for Laura's funeral when he speaks with Todd about Mr. Little's funeral tomorrow. And it turns out that there's been some confusion, Helen. Yes. Surprising for that Undertaker, I know. Yes. It comes out that both of them have spoken to a different Mrs. Little, and they yes. jump to the conclusion that Mr. One Little... One is tall and one is short. One is angry, one is sad. One is blonde, one's brunette. One has a moustache, one has a beard. <laughs> Mr. Little must have been a bigamist rather than he had a wife and a loving mum. Later, Todd will try to pitch an idea to the undertaker that they have two separate funerals yes. for Mr. Little so they can get paid twice. Well, and also, you know, so these two women don't find in death right. that their husband was a bigamist. Yeah. I don't think that's their call to make. Right. Well, but it, they have been paid twice. These two women obviously don't know. So legally, they can have two funerals. It's not that big of a deal. It's still fraud. Well, no. Because one time you're cremating them or burying them, and the other time you're not. Well, no. One, yeah, one time... Is this how, how Robert's getting, he's, he's getting lowered, dealt with? He's lowered down, and they just Take raise him back, him up, back up. Like, it's Easter weekend, so why not? Mr. Little has risen. Yes, he's, he's risen, risen indeed. indeed. <laughs> We're going to hell. Ugh, I think that was a that was a given. Well, maybe for you. Island gets back from a shop with tequila and enchiladas. They're going south of the border tonight. And guacamole. Aye. <laughs> Ay, caramba! Exclaims Undertaker as Island shakes her maracas, but not like that. But not like that. And she says, she says, andale while shaking the the, the maracas. Yeah. Which means quick, doesn't it? Quicken. Yeah, that's why Speedy Gonzalez says andale, andale, andale. Arriba. Right. That's not something that you say when you're shaking maracas. <laughs> Is she supposed to be shaking her maracas even quicker? I don't think I she don't knows know. what it means. She's when, only seen right. it because of Speedy Gonzalez. When I, when I think... When I think of the UK and Mexican culture, and it's funny because this came up in my Facebook memories. Oh, here we go memories. again with Smiling Jacks. I think of Smiling restaurant. Jacks who made their tacos and burritos with puffed pastry instead of tortilla shells. Was it bad? Yes. No, it wasn't. It was great. It was a great restaurant. I think it's, I think it's uh, under new management now. Who know what a tortilla is, hopefully. Anyway. Anyway. 
Later, <laughs> Eileen has put carrots and enchiladas instead of, instead of peppers because you'll never know the difference because women can't cook. Remember, right? And also, carrots and peppers are the same. In fairness, bell peppers are quite sweet, like carrots. The Undertaker reveals that he can't stay over because he has to take care of a lonely cat, but he's up for a quickie upstairs instead. Eileen throws him out. We're going to go through this again. Seems like it. Yes. On Friday. In the morning, Mary is looking for spunk stains on the sofa until Eileen informs her that the she, Undertaker didn't she stay over. Whipped out her black light <laughs> because he had to take care of his cat. So those stains are Todd's. <laughs> Mary is Sean's. Su- They're Sean's. Mary is surprised that the Undertaker has cats because usually it's enough to bring her out in hives. Hmm, says Eileen. Sean's back. He drops in on Eileen in the Undertaker's private conversation and as the Undertaker is recounting the story about the cat, Eileen notices some differences between the story that he told her, like its name and how it died. Right, yes. In in now instead of a a mobile library, it's it's an ice cream truck. Ice cream truck, yep. When it comes to Mary, Mary's allergy, he's able to explain that away given his meticulous attention to detail as an Undertaker who regularly fucks up. And also wears a lot of black. The Undertaker and Todd are loading up the hearse with someone other than Robert. They chat about the Mrs. Littles from the other day, but as they chat about keeping the two women happy and separate from each other, a passing Sean overhears and gets the wrong end of the stick. So he goes home to Eileen and Mary, and the women sense that Sean has info, and with some gentle probing, he reveals... And I like that. ...what, what he overheard, overheard Todd and The Undertaker talk about earlier. The Undertaker has another woman. And Todd knows about it. Eileen finds it hard to believe. If Todd knew this, he'd say something. He's loyal. Todd is a conniving little shite, says Mary. (laughs) Good point, says Sean. But Eileen insists there must be a reasonable explanation. The Undertaker isn't one of those guys. She knows. She's dated those guys. Mary says the only reason why he wouldn't want her to go to his place is because he must be married. So the Undertaker comes round later and asks to cook her a nice dinner at her house. Eileen wants to go to his house instead and he makes more feeling-based excuses and Eileen loses her shit and accuses him outright of hiding a wife and pretending that she's a cat. The Undertaker denies it all. Maybe she is a cat. And calls Sean's story a work thing and a misunderstanding. Let's go speak to Todd and get this straightened out once and for all until next time. Mm -hmm. In the rovers, Sean is trying to grill Todd about the Undertaker's woman when Eileen and the Undertaker come in and Eileen demands answers and it finally comes out that the other woman is the other Mrs. Little. All right, says Sean. (laughs) Back home, Eileen, Mary and Sean agree that despite the bigamy explanation from earlier, none of this explains what's going on about the cat. Eileen suspects that she'll have to do more digging into the Undertaker. But I like that. Nice little pun there. Mm. Digging for an Undertaker. And that's as far as we get with that. <coughs> We're doing this again. I like the vaudevillian comedy of errors, though. I, it's funny. It's ridiculous that we're doing this again, and we can't think of something else to do with Eileen and the Undertaker's relationship. But at least it's funny this time. But you see, because we've seen the Undertaker, we haven't seen Eileen much recently, but you see him and Eileen together in the same scene. Right. And you say it yourself, oh, the there's going to be a misunderstanding and they're going to break up then. Mm-hmm. Because that's that's all that happens with them. Yeah. So doing that again, but you, you seem to be giving us pass marks. I... Which is fine. I like... I like the comedy of errors, the, you know, the vaudeville of the, of the bigamy and stuff. I like that. I think it's funny. And I think it's charming. And I like... this. These are the storylines I like taught in. The ones that don't have anything to do with Billy. <laughs> right. The ones that are him and The Undertaker. They are funny together. They're, they're, they are they've together. got this you know, great father-son sort of thing going on. I was just surprised at how quickly The Undertaker now is interested in Todd's schemes. Because remember at the start, he was Todd was trying to right. pull the wool over people's eyes and try and uh, upsell and right. scam some money out of them. I think this is a bit of a different situation. This isn't necessarily scamming. This is trying to not hurt the sensibilities of two women who are mourning the loss of their husband and not realizing that he had another wife. Because I would be devastated to find that out about you at the end, which of course could never happen because you are always here. Yes. It'd be very difficult. <laughs> It'd be very difficult for you to have another life mm-hmm. that I don't know about. Not impossible, but difficult. That sounds like a challenge. 
I also have you on find find a friend. So. That's true. <laughs> so I uh, just think that bigamy is is just a as a soap thing that gets reached for a little too often. In fact, when was the last time we had a bigamy story on Coronation Street? Tim. Oh yeah, fair enough. And then Peter before it, which to be fair was quite some time ago. When was Peter a bigamist? With round about Simon's birth. Okay, so that was a long time ago before time I was ago. watching but the Tim show. Tim wasn't. No, Tim wasn't. It's a it's slightly different though because this is not. This is just kind of throwaway bigamy. It's not even been confirmed. It's they just suspect it. There might be a perfectly reasonable explanation for this. But don't don't the two women show up at the same time and that's what they're talking about when Sean overhears them? Well, is that the two women? So the two women do know that the other one exists now. I don't know. So that that's they all do. blown. That's all blown up. That's what. That's what Todd was talking about to the Undertaker. Is that they? He they kept were, them separate. Right, but they were both there at the same time. I don't know. I. It just to me it was funny and charming because I don't hear an awful lot of bigamy stories. The last time, <laughs> <laughs> the only other time in in popular culture that I have consumed that there's a bigamous story was I think it was in uh Tiny Toon Adventures where there was like like a farmer or something that wanted to wanted one the wanted Buster Bunny to marry both of his daughters and Buster Bunny says that's big of me and the farmer says no that's big of me and like bumps him out of the way with his large belly Oof. so <laughs> Tiny Toon Adventures Get worse, a dose of comedy. Worse than you thought. <laughs> so, you know, so it's not something that I consume an awful lot of. So I guess I'm more forgiving. Why does the it. Undertaker not want Eileen to go around to his house? Uh, I'm worried that it is like a wife in a coma or something like uh, Evelyn's ex. That, that must have come up before now. <laughs> that, you're not keeping that a secret for years. <laughs> well, ap- well, Evelyn's ex kept it a secret for quite some time. And if Eileen's never been to his house. That's weird. It, yeah, it is weird. And it's weird that it's taken this long for it to come up. Mm-hmm. That's the thing that bothers me. It's almost as if they've just thought of it. <laughs> That's what it's almost like. Well, he has hinted to like a dark, a darkness in his past that, you know, when he, when he was talking to Todd, that he's made mistakes in his life as well. So maybe he has corpses of dead women buried in his basement. Maybe this is where Robert is. <laughs> stuffed he's the des of coronation street um only straight um (laughs) or you know or he's got a he's got a kid i I think we can be safe to say that he doesn't have a cat no he doesn't have a cat so we can rule that out we can rule that out straight away someone is living in that house that he can't be away from for 24 hours that he has to take care of and he doesn't want to tell eileen about it or maybe and that he's ashamed of, or maybe his house is just disgusting. Maybe he doesn't have a house. Maybe he sleeps. But wait, didn't didn't Todd stay with the Undertaker for a little while? Stayed at the at the funeral parlor, I think. Which is just creepy. But maybe that's where the Undertaker's staying. Maybe he doesn't have a house. I, I don't know where there's a story in that, but maybe that's what it is. That he doesn't have enough money for a house oh, and he's, a he's loaded, home. I think. Yeah, a, that doesn't make any sense. The, the death business tends to pay pretty well. Especially during a pandemic. Right. Um, oh, gosh. It's going to be something that we haven't thought of. Let's, hope so. Be Let's st- hope so, because what we've thought of is shit. And it's going to be stupid. Moving on then. Our penultimate storyline today is Tim's mum about the house. frowny face this might be the last time we get to use that for For a while while. on wednesday sally's back from ice skating again and is horrified to find that tim's mum is still in the house her throw cushions have been changed and there's a sweaty imprint of tim's mum's bare foot on the fabric of her living room chair later sally gets a private word with tim she came back to get her hold but tim's mum was putting the kibosh on that she urges tim to speak to tim's mum and tell her to get the fuck once and for all 
Later, Tim's mum approaches Tim and tells him that she's picking up vibes from Sally that she's overstayed her welcome. Nah, you're fine, says Tim. <laughs> Sally's okay with me being here? Absolutely. And so Tim's mum makes Tim a nice glass of squash with a bendy straw. <laughs> I had a bendy straw like that. Squash is kind of like tang, yeah? It's the diluted uh, orange juice. So you get the, the concentrate and then you top it up with water from the tap usually. Yeah. So kind of like tang. Only I don't know what tang is. Tang is powder. Tang is astronaut food. Well, tang it's not was like invented by NASA. Then. It's a powder and you put water in it and then it's orange juice. Oh, well, yeah, I guess it's kind of like that. So except it's kind of like it. concentrate. Right, no. instead of powder. Yeah. Yeah. Later, Sally's confused why Tim's mum was in the bath and not kicked to the curb. Tim says that he tried to throw her out, but she still wants to take care of him. So what could I do? Tim suggests that Sally would be the same for her girls, which is true. Mm -hmm. And this is what gets him off the hook. Yes. On Friday, Sally can't find the tea bags, and Tim explains that the kitchen has been alphabetized thanks to Tim's mum. Well, this is the second time she hasn't been able to find the tea bags. First, Tim's mum moved it from wherever Sally had them to right by the Next kettle, up, which makes sense. Which does make sense. But then apparently because Sally was upset by this, Tim's mum reorganized again. And none of this makes any sense that she's like doing this in someone else's house. Right. And changing the cushions in someone else's house. And ordering uh, bed linen. In someone else's house. This is the stupidest fucking idea I've ever heard, says, says Sally. The bitch got to go. Yeah. So Sally comes clean with Tim's mum. Tea Fine. bags is where she draws the line. Both in the kitchen and in the bedroom. Doink. Thanks for taking care of my Tim, she says, but you're doing my tits in. Please leave. I'm getting the impression that you want me to leave, says Tim's mum. I'll pack my shit and I'll be on my way. Good, says Sally. So Tim's mum packs double quick time and is practically pushed into her car by Sally. Bye, Tim's mum, says bye Tim. Bye, 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 Tim, says bye Tim's mum. Bye, 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 fucks. bye. Right you, says Sally. Moan, get your hole. So Sally gets dressed up as an angry traffic warden who is about to lay down a very serious fine on Tim unless she gets her hole. Right. And the pair of them run up the stairs of Discovery. But little Tim hasn't shown up for work. He apologises to Sally, blaming the thought of Fergus putting them off. No <laughs> and worries, Sally says, says, in fairness, this is Fergus's hat. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, says Sally. And she goes off to get dressed, suggesting a wee trip to Fresco Freshco's later to cheer the pair of them up. And then, you know, time to take the batteries out of the remote. <laughs> right. And you can just get me off at least, says Sally. Tim has a wee word with a little general and yes. says, You need to sort yourself out. <laughs> and that's as far as we get with that this week. Yes. Oh, God. I mean, I'm. <laughs> again, here's a storyline with stuff we've seen before over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Sally is put out by Tim's mum. Tim's mum, for some reason, is buying new cushions and moving things around in the kitchen, something that you would never do. As, I as was, a guest. As I was listening to last year's episode uh -huh. for last year tonight, Tim's mum was like this a year ago. This is what Tim's mum does. She overstays her welcome and she puts her own impression on places where she's been permitted to stay. Right. So yeah, because she kind of did this to Yasmin. She did. At least she didn't buy lots of stuff and have boxes everywhere. Like well, that was Kathy that was Kathy. doing that. I saw the Kathy hoarding episodes uh, a couple of weeks ago. She was hoarding an awful lot of awful lot of stuff. Hmm. Yeah. And then the whole, you know, Sally and Tim finally get to have their hole, and then wah wah. Yep. We got a softy. Uh oh, can't even thumb it in. <laughs> Does Tim not think that maybe there are other ways for him to please his wife besides his penis? Come on, Tim. Use your imagination. And your tongue. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. your thinners. And your wife's vibrator. And a feather duster. Right. And her dildo. You know she's got one. Full of act. And that box of tricks. Yeah. I would imagine there's a, at least a couple. There's, there's one permanently on charge. Or, you know what? Use Sally's strap on because you know she's got one of them too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Poor Tim. Just wash it really, really well first. He's uh, he was he was sure that the Pele uh, comparisons weren't merited. Mm -hmm. it's, it's eaten away at his thoughts a little bit here. Maybe he has long COVID. Is that a symptom of long COVID? 
Erectile dysfunction, yes. Oh, maybe. Yeah. More should be made of that fact, and then maybe more men would actually get vaccinated. Get off your ass and go get vaccinated. People still aren't vaccinated. People think that it's over with Helen. It's done. It's, yeah. been, it's been done for weeks. It's just 50,000 people a day that are still dying of it. But it's fine. It's fine. Oh, well. I did enjoy Sally and the... Uh, <laughs> Sally's little, it's always Sally that dresses up, though. I'd quite like to see Tim. Well, Tim's got his... It's not Tim who dresses up. It's little Tim who dresses up. <laughs> so we don't see it, but little Tim is now wearing, is wearing a tuxedo under Tim's pants. <laughs> oh, He's got God. his little wee bow tie God. and a hat. <laughs> <laughs> see, now you're making me think about that. And spats on his testicles. It's, it's good to see another costume added to the repertoire to go along with the estate agent. Yeah, I don't think this costume's going to last, though. Because it's, it's Fergus's hat and then a vest. It was obviously far too big. If if she was just wearing the vest and didn't have a shirt on underneath it, that would have worked better. Maybe, but... And that wouldn't have been indecent. That would have covered all of her bits, all of her top bits. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. Our last storyline this morning is ladyeleven.co.uk. On Monday, Daisy runs into Daniel and suggests that they have a lovely day together, since it's a bank holiday. Have we mentioned it's a bank holiday? It's right. a bank holiday and on he Monday. hasn't spent any of the holidays with her but, at all yet. But Daniel announces that he has to go into school because the Edinburgh school trip isn't going to organise itself. Even though it was done. It just feels as though it is. In the Rovers, Daisy, <clears throat> in the Rovers, Daisy is making a packed lunch for Daniel at school. Jenny thinks that this makes Daisy a bit of a bunny boiler, seeing as that she obviously doesn't trust Daniel with Daisy, and this has got passive aggression written all over it. At the school, Daniel and Nicky are having way too much fun for supposedly organising a trip to Edinburgh, and Mrs Crawshaw comes in and is a bit sheepish as she thinks she's disturbed something between the two of them. She leaves and then bumps into Daisy, telling Daisy to knock before going into the room where Daniel and Nicky are still having a good old laugh about something. So Daisy knocks, again, passively mm-hmm. aggressively, and that shuts them up. Yes. Daisy explains that Mrs. Crawshaw mistook Daisy for a delivery driver, mm-hmm. and Crawshaw is shocked to find that it's Daisy who's Daniel's girlfriend and not Nikki. So Daisy gives Mrs. C the lunch basket, and Mrs. C grabs a wine out of it and runs away, shortly uh, followed by Daisy. And also one of the bagels with salmon and cream cheese. Daniel gets back to Rovers and is quick to patronise Daisy about reading a Janice Galloway book. It's called This Is Not About Me, and I'm sure I've seen uh, Janice Galloway read somewhere in Glasgow. Mm-hmm. She's pretty good. Yeah. And seem, it seems that Daisy is looking for reassurance here. She's hurt that Mrs. Crawshaw didn't know that she was his girlfriend and hurt that Daniel is happy to let her think that Nikki is. Daniel continues to gaslight her, tries to be smart, calls the row tedious and repetitive and then storms out when Daisy doesn't forgive him. He's so ridiculous this week. It's just so bad and it gets worse. Daisy talks to Jenny and Cinco Leo about this. Jenny still doesn't think it's all that important and says that Daisy is still Daniel's significant other. <laughs> Insignificant other, more like, says Daisy. And Jenny thinks that Nikki will soon get hitched up with someone because it's a truth universally acknowledged that a single woman in possession of a sex cardigan must be in want of her whole. Genius, says Daisy, who now decides to keep this Pride and Prejudice thing going by setting Nikki up with a fella. She'll be married and up the duff by Christmas. I just... That part, the whole buried it up the duff, it's like, why? What do you mean, why? Why not just, she'll be with a guy in no time. Especially considering this show does not want people to be married ah, before just, they start have children. It's just doubling it down. Just an expression, just like, a double down. Daisy do, you, Daisy, do you think people hope that you and Daniel are married and up the duff by Christmas? I don't it's think a she, very I, I don't backwards she, thing to say. I don't think she really means it. No. I know she doesn't because she's Daisy. But still, it just... I was quite shocked by, by that for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it's my American sensibilities. Sensibilities. On Wednesday. Yes, my sense and sensibilities, if you will. Well, it is a truth universally <laughs> acknowledged. On Wednesday, Daniel has dumped his invisible child off with his invisible dad. He walks to work with Daisy who announces... Quite literally! Yep. We see we see the camera pointed up at Daniel as Daniel said, No, no, go to granddad. No, I will see you later. As if he is talking to a child who wants him. Right. You did. He walks to work with Daisy who announces a plan to have drinks with Daniel and Nikki after work to celebrate Nikki's first day at school. 
And the Rovers, mm. Daisy is approaching all male customers to see if they have any single straight mates to throw at Nicky. Ryan is a hard no. Ryan's back! Yay! Yay! So at school, Daniel invites Nicky for a drink and she's all in and seems actually very up for it until she learns that it was Daisy's idea. Great, says Nicky. She seems to have better luck going through her black book, Daisy that is, yeah. trying to find a suitor. Jenny gets her, I told you so in early, just in case she's too busy later to say it. So Nikki and Daisy are having some vino and awkward chat while they wait on Daniel who's running late. Then Daisy's friend shows up and it's Ashley Fruit Juice. Nikki, this is Ashley Fruit Juice. Ashley Fruit Juice, this is Nikki. And it's obvious that the two of them have already met. Mm-hmm. So if the chat was awkward before, it's fucking chronic now. Ashley goes off for a shite in a pub and Nikki needs to go. She's only kept back when Daisy says that Daniel will be here in a minute. And on his way at the pub, Daniel sees Beth and Kirk on their way at the pub. He tries to talk them out of it when Nicky bursts out of the door and storms away. Hiya, Nicky, says Kirk. Prostitute Nicky, says Beth. And she uh. realises why Daniel was acting weird. Daniel runs after Nicky. So Daisy has been distracted, so doesn't notice that Nicky's left. And she quizzes Ashley Fruit Juice, who cagedly admits that he knows Nicky from before. But her name then was Tiffany Blue Knights. Daisy is lost, so Ashley spells it out. She's a sex worker, says Ashley. And Ashley would never say that. No, I think he would. No, because he's a horrible, mis- misogynistic footballer. Well, he's full of himself. I wouldn't call him misogynistic. He is. But he's also of a generation that would say sex worker and not prostitute. And I think the show is, it's very interesting that the show does make this dif- differentiation. What well, tries to. Because Beth is loudly screaming the word prostitute and prosy and other people are using the word pro it's very interesting to see who uses the word prostitute as if the word prostitute is fine to still use and the people who very consciously say sex worker it's also very interesting the people who acknowledge that nikki should feel no shame for having to do a job that was the only job at the time available to her and the people who want to condemn her for that Daniel catches up to Nicky. He thinks that she left because he was late and everything is about him. But she tells him that Daisy tried to set her up on a blind date with a former client. Why, oh, why must you always be defined by a job you don't do anymore, cries Daniel as he stuffs an old cardigan in his man bag. (laughs) Daniel finally gets to the pub and tells Daisy that he met Nicky outside and apparently she doesn't like blind dates. No shit, says Daisy, and she reveals that she learned from Ashley Fruitjuice that Nicky is a prostitute. Daniel is disappointed that Daisy has been so judgmental. She works with kids, says Daisy. Is the geography teacher selling crack? And Daniel reckons that she put all that behind her. Well, how would you know, says Daisy. Then Kirk mumbles his way to the bar, expressing surprise to see that Nicky's back in the scene. Ixne on the ostitute pay, says Daniel, to right. the side of his mouth. This is, this, this is where I just completely fell off of Daniel. The whole, okay, she knows, and now I have to pretend that I didn't know Right. Like, that's not going to fall apart immediately. This is where the gaslighting is just turned all the way up and is burning the kitchen curtains. <laughs> right. You know, Making because... you wish that you put some tile on there. Right. Because it's just... Oh, she found out. She knows. But I'm still going to pretend. But I'm still going right. to pretend. And I'm going to condemn her for being shocked at this news. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Daniel Lee so but- bad. Daniel leaves because Betty has been with Ken for nine days now. <laughs> Daisy learns that Kirk and Beth are not fans of Nikki, and Beth in particular is surprised that Daisy is okay with her being on the scene considering that she's a prostitute and Daniel used to be a client. Back at the flat, Daniel is able to juice that Daisy is angry. He thinks it's because <laughs> Nikki is a prostitute, but she reveals it's more because he's a liar. She spoke Sex to, worker. She bo- no, liar. She spoke to Beth and Kirk. Oh, says Daniel. He says that he never paid her for sex. He paid her to dress up as Sinead. And he thinks that's better. And Daisy looks at him for 15 minutes. (laughs) This is the thing. It's like, just (laughs) say that you were sad after your wife's death and you didn't want to be in a relationship. So you went to a sex worker. And of, you don't have to be this honest with Daisy. Please stop being this honest with Daisy. She storms out onto the street and he chases after her. She shouts it was bad enough that she thought that he paid for sex with her, but it turns out that he's Hannibal Flaming Lecter. <laughs> she tells him to give Nikki a call, or Tiffany Blue Knights as she used to be known. By day, she's a humble teaching assistant. By night, she's offering topless hand shandies in the gunnel for 40 quid. All of this is overheard by Max. 
Daniel insists it was depressed. He because was of course up. it is. He's not proud of it. She agrees to hear him out somehow. <sighs> Back home, Max is boggling Tiffany Blue Nights and is quite interested when the number one hit for it is ladylovin.co.uk calling Tiffany Blue Nights the Northwest's hottest escort. Interesting, says Max, before knocking a quick one out. <laughs> In the kitchen. So back at the flat, Daniel explains that this was all ages ago and he wants to support her out of sex working and into teaching assistant thing. And then he admits that he did have sex with her, but he never paid her. So she, so he's cheap. So it's okay. So he's cheap yeah, too. No. So when I did have sex with her, it's because we were in a relationship. So yeah, it was fine. Which I also didn't tell you about. Right, yeah. Daisy demands that he never sees her again and either he tells the school or they are finished. And see, this is this is the thing. If he had, when Nikki came back, and Daniel had said, had had not insisted that he and Nikki were never an item and they were always just friends and there was nothing weird going on. If he admitted flat out all of this right. at the beginning, Daisy would not have a problem with this. It It was the constant gaslighting and telling her, no, you're being jealous for no reason. There was never anything between Nikki and I. Yep. That's the problem. You've had it That's in. That's the problem here. You've had it in for Nikki since day one, and you never, you never trust me with her mm-hmm. because he never gives her any reason to trust. No, him. no. Yeah, if he'd come out and said, you know, she says, "Well, how do you know this Nikki?" Mm-hmm. He says, "Well, funny story. It's a funny story, and it's a little bit embarrassing, right?" But here's what happened. And you know, here's the thing too: is that. We had that conversation between Daniel and Nikki where Nikki seemed to also not want him to tell Daisy about what her former job was or was happy that he hadn't told her what her former job was. Right. And I think that's a problem in the storyline because when it's discovered what she used to do for a living and people are appalled and... Can, and some people are condemning Nikki says look this is something I had to do you know and I'm not ashamed of it well if you weren't ashamed of it then you should have told Daisy straight off what you used to do yeah she is ashamed of it she's very clearly ashamed of it right but she wasn't before right she was very um yes yeah. and at the time she was very upfront and this is what I have to do and don't right. you don't you dare be uh, feeling sorry for me or, right. or, or try to white knight me or try and get me into more gainful employment as i believe he did because right. remember he tried to like pay her out of right. prostitution or whatever and and she was like fuck you try to do that mm-hmm. yeah she's i'll do this like, on my own she's not like that anymore or she's not like that in parts of the storyline where it makes sense where, because plot on friday apparently nikki's walk to the bus stop takes her by the rovers which gives daisy a chance to mock uh, Nikki for being a prostitute with Sinead's cardigan. She even knows about the cardigan. Yes. Nikki isn't in the mood to apologise and explain some of the horrors that she had to endure just to take care of her family. And this makes Daisy see things from another perspective and she apologises. Yes. Nikki promises to give Daniel a wide berth from now on. Yes. So Daisy goes round to see Daniel, which is just what he wants. He refuses to not see Nikki anymore. Daisy realises that she was quick to condemn and suggests that they start over again, although she insists that he keeps his distance from her. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. Right. She's like, and he's like, well, I work with her. And she's like, well, that's fine. You know, you can obviously see her at work and stuff, but I don't don't hang out after work. Yep. He agrees to do what he can and keep her at arm's length. Right. Which is a very simple request to follow, one would think. Later that day, at lunchtime, and despite it being a bus ride away, Nicky meets Daniel doing his marking in Nina's roles, next to the solicitors talking about hoodwinking their clients, parents talking about DNA tests for their offspring, troubled teenagers looking up porn on the internet, and Ken Barlow. <laughs> Nicky is sad that the two of them can't be friends anymore, and he takes her hand. We'll always have the sex card again, he says. And just at that, Daisy walks in. Right. Arm's length, much. She screams, and then she storms out. Right, yeah. It's like... It seems like they both just wanted to avoid the school cafeteria to avoid one another. They both end up in the same place. And Daniel says, well, that didn't work. You might as well come and sit at my table Mm -hmm. now. And does not even try. 
to keep Nikki at arm's length. Later at he school. is the worst person after Kev. <laughs> Later at school, Max is trying to get some kudos currency from the cool kids at school who seem to hate him by they showing really them pics do. of Nikki from the sex internet. And they don't even look like cool kids. No. Nikki tells him to get in the class. Are you going to punish us in your sex dungeon? Asks Max. <laughs> what can he be talking about? Nikki seems to say. Are you going to give us a spiking? Then Crawshaw has summoned Nikki to a meeting. Nikki thinks it's about a run-in with Max from earlier. No, it's about you being a hooker, says Crawshaw. And Crawshaw explains about the pics and videos doing the rounds at the school in an parents' WhatsApp group. Yeah, it's the parents' group that I think is yeah. what it's... Crawshaw is disappointed that she failed to disclose this in her application. She shouldn't have had to. It's illegal to ask these sorts of questions on an application. And Nikki will be suspended pending further investigation. But in all honesty, her career as a teaching assistant at this school, and probably others, is utterly fucked. Your position here is utterly untenable, says Crawshaw. <sighs> Meanwhile, Daniel has bunked off school to go and apologise again to an upset Daisy. He, he continues to gaslight her by telling her that he and Nikki are only friends and what she saw was innocent. He has no more secrets. And then he kisses her on the forehead. And that to me is just like the... They're there. Go There's nothing going on here. Oh, fuck yourself, Daniel. He wants to sort this out, but he has to go back to school where Nikki is. Nikki is in the playground after packing her desk. Daniel sees her and learns that she's been suspended for prostitution. This is outrageous, shouts Daniel, <laughs> rolling up his sleeves. Let a man sort this out. And he goes off to speak to Crawshaw. Right. Who would sit after, me up? After Nikki very specifically says, it's no use, I wouldn't want to work here anymore anyway because now everybody knows. Yeah. Who would ah. set me up like this, says Nikki, non-ironically. Oh, I think I have an idea, says Daniel, ironically. This has Daisy written all over it. Nikki just wants to get out of here. There's pictures of me going around the school, shouts Nikki, while at school. And then Max pokes his head round the door and Daniel barks at him to fuck off. Everybody knows, says Nikki, and she breaks down crying. In the pub, Daisy overhears Maria and Shona and David talking about Nikki. It's all round the parents' WhatsApp group, David says, that Nikki's on game. In comes Daniel, calls Daisy a horrible fucking cow and he leaves. Daisy, for a second, looks like she's just letting that wash over her until she twigs. Oi, you, she shouts. She chases after him. In the street, she denies doing anything, but he's not having any of it and accuses her of sending links around to school. Who would that even send anything right, to, yeah, she says. Correctly, she's like, I don't have kids in that school. Who do you think I would even do that? Only someone as malicious as you would do something like this, says Daniel. And there's nobody else malicious who would do something like this on the street. That I've spoken to today. Right. Daisy reminds him that he was the one who was lying about all of this, but he says that Nikki is in tears and he calls Daisy a liar. And just stop lying, Daisy. It's not even that you're good at it. Actually, Daisy is a pretty good liar. She's a very good, she's a better liar than Daniel is. Now, if you don't mind, says Daniel, I'm off to salvage my friend's career. And by the way, We're you're done. Dumped. Daisy. I'm off to salvage my friend's career. What right. a fucking prick. What an asshole. Back at his flat, Daniel explains to Nikki that he's dumped Daisy. Nikki is still upset because she won't be able to afford a deposit on her new place now. So Daniel tells her that she and her daughter can stay with him and Paul and Bertie in his two bedroom flat. Where was she staying before? Right. Right. Back at the Rovers, Daisy maintains her innocence to Jenny, despite all her character traits that suggest otherwise. No matter what happens now, she's done with that prick. No one speaks to Daisy Midgley like that and gets away with it. That's says right. Daisy. Then on the street, Daniel sees Shona tearing a strip from Max because the sharing photos of Nikki has been traced back to him. Max says he only passed on what he was sent, but Shona knows that that's not true because she's been looking at his laptop <laughs> search history. That's they've private, been, says that's, Max. That's, yeah, they've been keeping a close tab on you there, Max, because of the whole... Everything else, right? Get in that fucking house, shouts Shona, and she and Max slink off, and Daniel looks forlornly at the rovers. Oh, pig's tits, his beard seems to say. And that brings us on to this week's Hard Debate. It looks like being a busy old week for Daniel next week, but what do we think is going to be keeping him most occupied? Gaslighting Daisy, White Knight and Nikki, cancelling Max, or parenting Bertie? I chose parenting Bertie because it was the least likely of those. <laughs> right. So it was the funniest. So... 9.6% of people agreed with you at Parent and Bertie. 26% hmm. thought cancelling Max, 28.8% White Knight and Nikki, and 35.8% 
gaslighting Daisy. And that's how we end this week's episodes. <sighs> Despite all of this, I think there's something that I'm very much enjoying out of this storyline. The first thing that I'm really enjoying out of this storyline is how the Daisy character has turned round. Because you might remember that I and, hated her at the beginning. And yet it's still herself. Yes. Yes. This is still the same Daisy. This is still believably the same. This isn't like Crawshaw last week doing a complete 180 on her personality. Yeah, just for last week. Just for last week. Although and just for last. Divine, she's a little, yeah, she's still kind of flustered about talking to people for some reason all of a sudden now. Right. But the conversation with Nikki, I thought, was very good because she 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 seemed genuinely sympathetic yep. to, Na- to Daisy's situation. There's nothing I can do about this. There's nothing I can do about this because the school illegally requests that you post all of this information on your application. Well, even I feel like that's a, a red herring anyway because the fact remains that if people if she's she admits that it's true, mm-hmm. and it, she's lost the respect of the um, the pupils. Right. The parents right. and uh, fellow teachers, rightly or wrongly. Right. So it does Why make a position Why is that website untenable. still advertising her when she's no longer in business The internet there. is in pen, not in pencil. This is true. But I'm really enjoying this. The way that you're right, because she's still Daisy, but she is a likable version of her now. Yeah. I'm totally Team Daisy. Absolutely. You can't not be Team Daisy in this. But what I'm also really appreciating is the relationship that she has with Jenny. Yes. Because Jenny's not in this very much. No. But when she is in it, she's kind of got this this air about her where, well, this is Daisy, mm-hmm. right? So I'm going to get my I told you so and early and all right. this sort of stuff. I thought it was fantastic. The relationship that the two of them have and the way that the two of them work together is is wonderful. And I like... a total highlight. And I like Leo. Kind of just sitting there and not saying very much, not saying very much, and just kind of shaking his head at, you know, oh, here are my ladies arguing about stuff. Here's my my stepdaughter, (laughs) pretty much, (laughs) who's my age. But you know, yeah, I really, and you know what, Johnny had to die. Yeah, Johnny had to die for us to get this relationship. Right. Yeah. He, He could not live. He gave his life. So Daisy Much could, like Christ so, so Daisy, for this storyline. Except he didn't rise again. <laughs> he did he not. sunk like a stone. Well, he rose, he bobbed up and down a couple of times okay. and then sank like a stone. That's good enough. That was rolled away. Yeah, it gave Daisy the ability to focus on something other than her disapproval of Jenny and Johnny being together. Right. Because now that she's got that out of the way, she's, she is more likable. Right. But she does have aspects about her that are thoroughly disagreeable but right. she's, she's likable with it right it's like billy it's like billy or billy and todd you know todd is deplorable with billy but is delightful with the undertaker right. there are these characters that are still the same character mm-hmm. and are not different from it, it's just with certain people they're just demonstrably better do you think the show knows how much daniel is gaslighting daisy I think they do because it is part of his personality to gaslight women and white knight women. This is this is what he does. Because it's ridiculous the amount of it that's going on. Do you think the show is is poking the eye of what what was the show that fired one of the actors for having an OnlyFans? Oh, I can't remember. One of the I know, others. I know, I know yeah. what you're talking about. I don't but think it, so. It, it it feels like the show is proclaiming that they are more woke when it comes to sex work and. Oh, I didn't pick Stuff up on like that. that That's possible, I guess, but I never thought Then Then other shows. And look at us. Look at Coronation Street. We're with the sex workers. And, I, you know, like I said, there, there's, very, there's a very clear delineation between the people on the show, the characters on the show, who call Nikki a prosy mm-hmm. or a prostitute. Or as David says, aunt game. Right, which, that's, that's David. Or use the word sex worker. And the ones who are like that poor girl, you know, to to have this blasted around and the people who are not sympathetic at all and, you know, and look down on her and everything. You know, there's... The, the, but the, the show seems to be saying something without shoving it down our throats. The bit that, that kind of confuses me a little is that Ashley Fruit Juice's introduction to the whole thing 
unknowing Nikki. And Nikki reveals that, well, there was a time when I was at my, I should tell you the story about the time I was at my a wedding and the father of the bride mm -hmm. knew me. So this seems to happen with some kind of regularity. So I'm wondering what was her, what kind of thoughts went through her head that thought that a teaching assistant job where you're going to be introduced to hundreds of kids and, and hundreds, hundreds of, of parents. fathers. Right. That maybe this wasn't the best. Maybe this wasn't the best role. place to get a job. Right. Maybe you should have tried a little bit further afield. Like working in devs or something like that. Or not in Manchester. <laughs> right. <laughs> Move away and become, if, if this is, if this is what you want to do with your life, become a teacher, maybe not do it in the area where you had clients. This was a ticking time bomb and she, she only seemed to kind of realise, she seemed to realise that but not put the, the two together. Yeah, quite frankly, I was a little surprised by how many characters on the street didn't know this about her already. Because Beth knew. <laughs> right. If Beth knew, everybody on the street should have known already. Because you'd think Beth would have been bitching about Daniel and his prosy up and down the street uh, um, for weeks because she's she's complained about Daniel while at her sewing machine before. Yeah. I guess I'm uh, also a little disappointed that we didn't get to hear the conversation where Daniel did admit to the cardigan thing. Yeah. That would have been a fun conversation to listen to. Right, where he just said, I paid her to sh to dress up like Sinead. Does he mention the perfume? He doesn't mention the perfume. And we, d we don't hear him mention the cardigan, but Daisy yeah. mentions the cardigan. Yeah. So he's definitely told her. That he was sad. He's a sad man. It it's nice that Daniel admits that it was weird. And maybe inappropriate to have to have her do this. It's good that he knows this now. It's it's about the only the only light that is shining positively on Daniel and and all of this. I I don't know. I I, I worry that there are people that are Team Daniel in all of this, and I, I worry that those people exist that that aren't seeing what we're seeing, and aren't seeing what maybe the show is hopefully trying to show. Other white nighters, you mean? Yeah, probably. Yeah. In fairness, that may not be the case. Although there may be women who are watching the show who like to be white knighted, but at, at the the demographic of straight men who watch the show is basically what you. <laughs> so I'm sure there must be others. <laughs> My dad used to work, watch it. He's dead now. There are men who watch it with their wives. You know, there's 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 assuredly a demographic of of women who who find this type of thing romantic. But it's the gaslighting part of it as well, though. That yeah, is is very insidious. That just you know, the when when he comes back in and Daisy confronts him with the facts, and he pretends that he didn't know, and then condemns her for being shocked by this information. Yeah, you're better than this, he says. Oh, Fuck off. But again. Daniel was like this with Bethany. Daniel was like this with Sinead. Mm -hmm. This is Daniel all over. Right. He uh, and he he wasn't like this with Lydia. Interestingly. Well, we didn't get a chance to see very much of that. That's true. Because she read books. Right. She did. She read books. Well, that about wraps it up for another week with Coronation Street. What was your moment of the week? <sighs> Everybody wants us to give it to to Billy and Summer, and the conversation on the couch. Yeah, and I'm inclined to. Agree. I mean, uh, yeah, it, with the with with the proviso that I didn't like the fact that they cut some Gary and Kelly stuff into it and didn't just give us this whole conversation straight, which is how I would have preferred to have had it. Yeah, that was, that was it. Like, was the moment of the? It was there was really nothing else. I can't damning with faint praise, but <laughs> but I, I, no, I thought it was a great scene. It, it was a great scene. It, and also, unfortunately, it's this great scene and it's this very sweet scene and Billy is so supportive, but then he turns around and immediately calls the the League of Gentlemen Fathers right. and kind of blows it all to pieces how understanding he was of Summer. It's the moment of the week. So right. in that moment, though. Yes, in that moment, that is our moment of the week. Moment of the week. Boring moment of the week. Daniel talking to Invisible Bernie. Birdie. Is it Kirk with Wicked Fresh? No, we're not going to do that to, to Kirk again. So we're going to do it to Daniel again, though. Yes, because Daniel deserves it. Was that boring, though? It was. It was stupid. Was it? it was stupid. And it you didn't need it. Do we? Did we need that? 
Did we need that? We we've seen Daniel shove his kid into other people's welcoming arms over and over and over again. We didn't need to no, get away from the door. Daddy's gotta go. Go to granddad. What's that, granddad? Yes, he's coming right now. Yeah, that was dumb. Oh, Come on. Fair enough. For a moment of the week. Fuck you, Daniel. <laughs> Today's episode was sponsored by Fuck You, Daniel. <laughs> and Steve Martin. If you'd like to sponsor a future episode of The Talk of the Street, we are the Talk of the Street at gmail.com and we're at Corey Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can shout me in hell on the coffee by heading to kofi.com. That's ko fi.com slash the talk of the street. Check out the clicky clicky section of vogel.co.uk for links to our merch store and YouTube channel. And if you're so inclined, please leave a rating and a review on the iTunes or your podcast provider of choice. Thanks for making it to the end of another episode. And we will be back next week with more. The Talk of the Street. The Talk of the Street. Cheerio. Bye.